Hello, Stacy Ann. How are you? Yes. Great. You're <laughs> you're a powerful presence now. We. we <laughs> My huge on the screen. Yes. <laughs> All right. Thank you. That's great. So, tasked with organizing a panel on the international context, uh, I did what any reasonable person would do if they had been here yesterday. And that is, last night I went to chat GPT to try to write a poem to, uh, to introduce this panel. Uh, actually, we'll leave the, the poetry uh, for now, and I'll just say that you know, there is a, a region which I think might have some instructive lessons for us, and it's a region which actually started using parametric insurance some time ago, and we're very pleased to have one of the architects of that, uh, of that policy here. Uh, I went to a conference as a World Bank consultant in Barbados in 2019, and remember a keynote by Mia Motley, the prime minister who had managed, has managed since then to get the first uh, climate conditionality attached to IMF lending. And that was a real moment of awakening for me to see that some of the, some of the poorer nations in the world, uh, some of the smaller nations in the world, some of our neighbors who we take for granted were actually able to uh, construct uh, innovations in this space that I think we could learn a lot from. And so we have decided to focus this panel on the Caribbean and you know, unlike the US, which can't coordinate across states and localities regarding zoning and building permits, let alone national policies and standards, as we heard yesterday, the 18 nations of the Caribbean have created a disaster relief agency, uh, a catastrophe risk insurance risk pooling facility, and they've done that with a GDP that is just a small, small fraction of that of the US. And so I think it's an instructive case, the Caribbean. Uh, you know, and and why, why and how have they been able to do this? I think that's part of what we're going to talk about. And uh, just a few questions more than answers, but you know, it seems that people in the Caribbean have no choice as their risk pool is really not diversified. Um, many or most of them suffer uh, when each of the hurricanes hits. So they are affected by climate change weather, and they're affected uniformly, unlike other parts of the world, including the US, where so far, even with all of the testaments from, that we've heard yesterday and, and we'll hear later today, uh, in the US, much of this is restricted to certain parts of the country, whereas other parts can have different political views and can afford to not worry so much about it until this point. And so in, in many of you know, other parts of the world, including the Caribbean, there's little political division because adaptation is a day-to-day -day exercise that they must execute and be part of. Uh, so there's, there's a lesson there. There seem to be fewer jurisdictional battles among levels of government in the Caribbean. It seems that often people are just happy to have one level be willing to address some of these questions rather than having to worry about who is going to have jurisdiction. And there is the moral hazard question that was mentioned yesterday, I believe, by Alice Hill in the US, right, which is that you know, local jurisdictions can pretty much do whatever they need to do or want to do, because at the end of the day, the federal government is going to have responsibility. And I think she laid out some of the issues and questions relating to this moral hazard, this, uh, this idea, the, this, this risky behavior, these incentives for 
particularly perhaps local officials in the US, to, um, to not have to worry as much and to not have to cover as much. So there's a lot to learn from the Caribbean. And I'm going to turn now to uh, Professor Stacy Ann Robinson, who's an associate professor of environmental studies at Colby College, and a former diplomat representing Jamaica to UN agencies on a range of issues, including some relating to, to climate change. Thank you, Stacy Ann. Welcome. And we're glad that, uh, that this virtual setup worked. It does seem. Well, it did drop one, so hopefully not again. <laughs> okay. uh, just saying <laughs> good morning to everyone. Thank you so much for having me. I sincerely apologize for not being able to be there in person. So on Todd's kind invitation, I've been asked to speak about the Caribbean context. So I thought I would refine the presentation a little bit and zoom in on adapting to slow and rapid onset climate risk in small islands. So today I wanna speak very briefly, hopefully, about uh, climate risks in small islands, drawing on some of the data that has been presented in the IPCC reports, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. I wanna talk a little bit about slow onset processes focusing on sea level rise, also on rapid onset events and within the Caribbean, a heavy focus on hurricanes or tropical cyclones and talk a little bit about barriers, limits, and opportunities. So in preparing this talk, I had a thought. And the thought that I had, and I'll share with you right now, is that I have a feeling that the work on climate risk in small islands focuses almost predominantly or primarily on cyclones, so the rapid onset events. And this is especially so when we're thinking about uh, climate impacts, adaptation, and vulnerability. But what about the risk from slow onset processes? Again, I mentioned sea level rise, but we can also think about issues such as ocean acidification and salinization. Are we avoiding the big issue? So just to give you an overview of the difference between the slow onset processes and the rapid onset events, we can uh, begin to see the differences if we're thinking about time frame, if we're thinking about predictability, if we're thinking about impacts, and also the level of impacts. So for the purposes of this presentation, we could actually have a focus on the time frame and the predictability, which both have implications for risk management and insurance provision. So focuses on, focusing on time frame, we can look at a slow onset events. These are slow, obviously, unfolding over several years, as opposed to these rapid onset events that can occur quite quickly within a matter of days or hours. Predictability for slow onset uh, processes, not so much. They tend to have greater interaction with anthropogenic uh, parameters and external stressors. And for rapid onset events, this is not necessarily foreseeable regarding their frequency and intensity because they just hit. If we're looking to the IPCC report, I like to go back to the fifth assessment report and the contribution of working group two. There was a chapter in that report on small islands, uh, chapter 29, and this is my favorite uh, illustration in the entire body of IPCC uh, reports, whether the, the assessment reports or the special reports. And because this figure illustrates uh, the confidence that the IPCC has in the detection of certain climate or, or certain impacts, and also the attribution uh, that it can give to these detectable um, impacts. And I want you to focus your attention on number two, which is sea level rise consistent with global means. So at this time, what the science was saying, it allowed the IPCC to say, yes, it has high confidence in, it, in the detection of sea level rise and, and very high confidence in its attribution to uh, climate change. So sea level rise is a slow onset process, but I also want to take your attention to number 17, which is casualties and damage during extreme events. And within the context of tropical small islands, we can almost immediately 
focus on tropical cyclones and hurricanes. So at that time, based on the science, the IPCC was able to say, yes, we have very high confidence in the detection of these rapid onset events, meaning we see them. But in terms of attribution to climate change, that confidence is actually low. So moving on from the fifth assessment report, we can look at the special report on oceans and cryospheres, which was published in 2019. And at that time, the IPCC was able to say, yes, with absolute certainty, global mean sea level is rising, but the non-climatic anthropogenic drivers, and here we can think of settlement and demographic changes, have played a role in ex uh, increasing exposure and vulnerability to sea level rise. So at that time, with certainty, yes, coastal ecosystems were already impacted, coastal risk was already dynamic and increasing, but also a recognition that we needed a diversity of adaptation responses to deal with these uh, coastal impacts and risks. So in the context of the Caribbean, we can see this emphasis in the low-line islands. And a few examples include Antigua and Barbuda, uh, perhaps Bahamas or the Tortugas off the coast of Haiti. So now I'd like to bring your attention to uh, AR6 at the sixth assessment report of the IPCC Working Group 1 uh, contribution that was released in 2021. Uh, and Working Group 1 focuses on the physical science. Uh, yes, sea levels will continue to rise. Sea level rise is uh, exacerbated by coastal inundation and the potential for increased saltwater intrusion. And yes, sea level rise will cause shorelines to retreat along sandy coasts in most small islands. But uh, almost most importantly, uh, small islands will face more intense, but generally fewer tropical cyclones except in the central North Pacific. Now, this might be a little curious uh, to some persons and definitely a little curious to me. So I wanna focus on tropical cyclones and in the small islands chapter in AR6, but this is working group two's contribution that was released in 20, uh, 20, 2022. Uh, we can see in the general trends, right? There's lots of variability according to the basin. We can also see that the data in some cases is specific to the subregion. So in the Caribbean, this table uh, almost has a focus on the Lesser Antilles. And we can also see that in some basins, there's absolutely no data. But separate and apart from this, there are certain things that we are sure about. Tropical cyclones or hurricanes are growing stronger and more destructive. Yes, the cases for intensity, but not necessarily frequency. And hurricanes are producing heavier rainfall. Their storm surges are riding at top sea levels, which are already higher. And in many cases, they're lingering longer overland, causing increased flooding and infrastructure damage. But in the Caribbean, there is a lot of geographical differentiation. And if we're thinking about the countries there as small island developing states or states, which is a political classification, we see that there are 29 countries there. But if you're thinking about your individual experience, perhaps with a Caribbean island or a Caribbean low-lying coastal country, you can begin to see that there is significant differentiation if we're thinking about physical geography, if we're thinking about political geography, and if we're thinking about development geography. I came across this quote from a Canadian astronaut that I thought was very useful here. He said, when you're on one of the Caribbean islands, sometimes it's hard to picture how they fit in with the rest. But when you see them all joined together like a necklace from space, you see the natural geographic connectedness of them all. I'm gonna argue that this quote, as well as the evidence, allows me to make a claim that there's disproportionate vulnerability to the impacts of climate change in the Caribbean. So if we're thinking about vulnerability in these three constructs, high exposure, Yes, there's dense coastal population. Many of the islands are low-lying, though not all of them. There's also high uh, sensitivity, 
heavy economic reliance on coastal ecosystems, particularly tourism and fisheries, and generally, but not in all cases, there is low adaptive capacity. There is a narrow range of political institutions. Countries are dealing with colonial legacies and restrictions on their access to finance and their ability to invest in response, in recovery, in adaptations. Focusing on these hazards, yes, they are very costly. And up to 2022, the five costliest US Earth system hazards have all been cyclones or hurricanes. So not earthquakes, not volcanic eruptions, and certainly not bushfires. And another thing that's important to remember is that these five hurricanes have occurred in the past 15 years. You might remember Katrina or Sandy, Harvey's a little bit more recent, so is Maria, and uh, last year, a big hurricane, Ian. But when you're thinking about the US Earth system, one thing to bear in mind is that all these systems passed through the Caribbean first. So we can have a focus on the 2017 North Atlantic hurricane season. And interestingly, the Small Islands Chapter in Working Group 2's contribution to the IPCC sixth assessment report also had a focus on the 2017 hurricane season. And why? Because it was the costliest tropical cyclone on record. You can just see the numbers of depressions, total storms, total hurricanes, major hurricanes, but the fatalities were great. Over 3,000 uh, persons lost their lives, but the damage almost close to 300 billion US dollars. One thing that I want to point out here is that Puerto Rico accounted for almost a third um, of this damage. And another important thing is that we can't forget that Puerto Rico is a part of the United States. So just to bring us through some illustrations, some photos of the damage caused uh, in the 2017 uh, season, we can have a focus on Antigua and Barbuda, which most of the population lives on the coast. If we were to move over to the BVI, the British Virgin Islands, we can see the destruction here and we can identify um, just the proportion of the GDP that's, uh, that's dependent on tourism and that's upward of 80%, but it's not the only country in the region. Uh, similarly, we can focus on the adaptive capacity Cuba, for example, where wages are around $30 per month. And uh, Cuba is not the poorest country uh, in the Caribbean, so we have to consider income across all countries. So what does this mean for adapting uh, to these new climate risks that are getting worse in some respects, more intense, and in other respects, more frequent? Is that the frequency of the events, some of them are very compounded in nature, an example is Antigua and Barbuda in the 2017 season, that it had tremendous impact from Irma, but not too long after from Jose as well. We can also consider the scale and magnitude of the events. Dominica, for example, with tropical uh, storm Erica, uh, had uh, impacts that probably equal the impacts that you'd expect from a category five hurricane. Uh, Hurricane Dorian in 2019 was the strongest uh, a hurricane to ever make landfall in the Bahamas. We can also think about the appropriateness of insurance and also the availability of insurance for various infrastructure types, tourism, say for example, versus residential infrastructure. So this is a little bit different from limits. And it depends on your perspective on this, but we can definitely consider location and the size of these countries. Again, it's really hard for me personally to differentiate the compounded nature of the events uh, if we're gonna consider the barriers versus limits. And in thinking about the income of some of these countries, Antigua and Barbuda, Bahamas, for example, they're high income economies and this affects their uh, access to concessional financing. Okay. So finally. Thanks, sorry, I was just about to say that we're gonna <laughs> move on, but thank you. Okay, great. <laughs> right, finally, we can think about the opportunities in and for the Caribbean. Yes, we have made progress in terms of regional governance and coordination. Yes, we have bold leadership from uh, prime ministers such as Mia Motley and the reform of the international architecture. 
but their interest in developments uh, in the international courts at the moment, the ICJ and ITLAS, for example, where small island countries have asked for advisory opinions on the responsibility for climate change. Okay, thank you. And thank you, sorry to, to interrupt um, as, thank you so much for setting up the, the, the frame of the question. And so now I will ask uh, Mary Boyer to take it from here and perhaps discuss some of the tools that have been uh, set up uh, to help contextualize and broaden the, um, the, I mean, the issues that you have raised about the, the severity and the frequency uh, of uh, climate weather and also the, the difficulty in dealing with it. Um, nonetheless, you know, there have been international efforts made and Mary Boyer is a disaster risk management specialist with the World Bank's Global Facility for Disaster Reduction and Recovery. And she's focused on uh, the Caribbean, but also more broadly. And we ask you to take it from here. And then we'll have, uh, lastly, uh, Jerry Skies, who's the founder and executive director of Global Parametrics, which provides risk assessment and manages risk capital in many parts of the world. And we wanna give each of them also about 12 minutes to talk so that we can have time, please, to, to broaden the discussion and open it up to the audience. Thank you. Um, you can stay there or come here, however you'd like to do it. Oh, the slides, I'm sorry, of course, the slides. Um, which should be right here. Okay, thank you, sorry. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Todd, for the introduction. I'm so pleased to be here. Uh, you'll see the title of my presentation is Parametric Insurance and Sovereign Risk Pools. I usually uh, spend a lot of time talking with ministers of finance and other decision makers about the benefits of these kinds of tools, but this is probably the most educated uh, room I've ever spoken to on these topics. I'm going to focus less on, on what these instruments are. And Jerry is going to talk a lot about that next. But I'm going to focus more on how the World Bank has supported countries to use these instruments as part of their overall disaster risk financing. As we heard from Ms. McFadden this morning, there is a, a bit of a gap in how governments, especially US government, is thinking about this in advance, ex ante, to prepare financially and physically for disasters. So, this first slide is a bit about the evolution of how the World Bank has worked on disaster risk management, really how the international community views disaster risk management. Um, in the 60s and 70s, 80s, we've been really good at post-disaster reconstruction, rushing in and saying, hey, we've got money, or the bank saying, hey, we've got money to loan you. We can build back better. We can do all these things. Uh, 80s, 90s, early 2000s started talking about risk identification, risk reduction. Uh, using hazard models to, to make risk-based decisions on, on the disaster management systems that should be in place early on, building more resilient roads, more resilient bridges, uh, you know, more resilient coastal ecosystems, et cetera, ensuring that natural hazards did not turn into disasters. Um, especially in the Caribbean, we know that cyclically, heavy rainfall and heavy winds are going to happen usually every year. And so how can we prepare in advance to make sure that these natural hazards do not become disasters? And then in around the early 2000s, moving in 2010, 2020, of course, we're focusing on financial protection. How to ensure that these disasters don't turn into economic shocks? And in the Caribbean, it is an economic shock. Um, as, as Dr. Robinson was just saying, these countries have GDPs that are tiny, but disasters can impact 100%, 200% of their GDP. It's an economic shock uh, with adverse impacts on um, debt, uh, sustainability, declines in GDP, uh, regional spillovers, and long-term economic growth. These countries in the Caribbean have worked hard on reducing poverty. You know, they are um, middle high income, as was just said, but still there's a lot of issues with vulnerable populations and equity. So how, with all the progress being made and disasters happening, how do you reduce that economic impact to keep a positive uh, development trajectory? So I'm gonna breeze through this, but um, these disasters financing help 
these strategies help uh, countries react to these devastating events. In 2017, there was Hurricane Maria, and this is a photo of Dominica, the waterfront, the big capital um, productive area within Dominica. Impacts of 226% of GDP. That's almost unimaginable. Um, and fortunately, they had CRIF in place, the Caribbean Task Force Risk Insurance Facility, that made liquidity available quickly. Um, and there was, of course, a, a big international response, uh, ex ante, or ex post, rather, making funds available. Um, but this really pushed Dominica to set up a climate resilience execution agency to say, look, we can't deal with this again. This set us back years and years in development. We're setting up an agency to determine how we can best plan in, in advance for these kind of impacts. Uh, and that's when they reached out to the World Bank to help them to develop a disaster risk financing strategy. But then in the Caribbean, as I meant, there is annual, annual impacts that have less catastrophic events, but nonetheless have kind of attritional impacts on, on GDP, on productivity, et cetera. So this is a photo of Belize um, that is indicative of kind of their annual maybe one in five year rainfall events. Um, and if you know Belize, this is the road from Belize City to Belmopan, one of the busiest um, roads in Belize that connects economic centers to government. And if this road's blocked, the country's kind of, you know, out of luck. Uh, so this happens continually. So instead of, you know, paying for, for cleanup and paying for, um, for recovery, how do we look at risk-based decision making to say, let's do some risk reduction in advance to make sure that this flooding doesn't happen. If we see through ob observation and risk modeling that these impacts are going to happen on an annual basis, let's talk instead about risk financing and, and financial response, but more about risk reduction. So how do you help countries balance between having financial instruments uh, to respond to events quickly, but also uh, balancing that with investing in risk reduction ex ante? Governments also have specific concerns about financing. So if they're joining a sovereign risk pool like CRIF or any other kind of insurance product, what if, a, what if a payout's not triggered? What if we don't get a payout? I'm making a political decision to buy this insurance product, convincing my cabinet to buy it, but what if I don't get a payout? This is going to look bad for me. It looked like I wasted money. Um, how do we afford both a contingency fund and an insurance premium? How do we afford to set aside money for a rainy day or for... Um, a reserve fund to respond to disasters and also continue to pay for insurance premiums? How do we protect low-income households? How do we set up scalable social protection uh, that can very quickly um, find those vulnerable populations that have been impacted by a disaster and ensure that they get the, either the physical or the economic support they need to bounce back and return to being a productive part of society? Um, and that reduces further losses on the economic side as well. And a lot of countries in the Caribbean are in debt distress, like Jamaica, for example, historically, or, or really in, um, in some kind of debt sustainability question where the IMF or the World Bank has helped them implement these fiscal rules to limit spending, uh, to really help them get their debt sustainability on track. And um, how do we quickly access post-disaster financing, move around funding uh, within the bounds of our fiscal rules? And Ms. McFadden was talking about that a bit earlier as well. In the United States, um, how do we quickly access uh, post-disaster financing, have procurement processes in place that are you know, flexible and adaptable to these emergency situations? And at the World Bank, we, we took all these questions into account. We took this high demand from, from governments in, in the Caribbean on, on how to come up with these strategies. Um, and we came up with a pretty simple approach. First, help countries quantify their fiscal risk. Um, you don't buy insurance for your house um, out of the blue. You know how much your house is worth. You know where you are in terms of floodplain. You know the risk. You can quantify it and, and buy the appropriate insurance. You can help countries quantify their contingent liabilities to, to disasters through looking at their public assets, their built assets, um, and, and quantifying the risk they have on an annual average basis or, or um or you know, what kind of risks they have to, to cover after an event happens. And then we look at the, these, the options that are available to them to reduce that fiscal risk. Um, if they don't have a reserve fund in place, how do we help them establish a reserve fund? Uh, how can we help them access other insurance uh, instruments or tools or talk about data collection and management strategies that can better inform risk-based um, 
risk-based decision-making. So we look at kind of a diagnostic of, of their strengths and weaknesses and, and help them identify options for improvement. But most importantly, it's building capacity. I mean, we're a panel of experts coming in and helping governments to identify these things, but it's not going to be sustainable unless we are educating and, and training and establishing courses within community colleges to build, the, to build the environment of risk reduction, asset valuation, asset condition assessment, risk modeling, um, building that within the Caribbean. We did this at a regional scale with the University of the West Indies in developing a course in disaster risk financing. Okay, so quickly through this, ignore the, the blue parts. The blue parts are the different instruments that we work with countries on. But what's most important is this comprehensive approach. It's not just about financial instruments. It's about the, as I mentioned, the environment for these financial instruments to exist. So in the orange, improving data coordination and management. Um, you can't have risk modeling. You can't have uh, quantifying risk if you don't have an inventory of public assets, if you can't uh, quantify the value of those assets, et cetera. And also, like damage and loss data collection, you'd be surprised that a lot of Caribbean countries have struggle in just assessing their own damage and having that publicly available. Uh, so making sure that the data environment is there, but also on the public financial management side. Um, first of all, approving a strategy that your government's going to follow in reducing risk um, so that everybody's on the same page and saying, here are the instruments we have, here's what we're going to access first, here's what we access if it's catastrophic, here's where we go if it's just annual flooding, um, and here are the procurement processes and the, um, the financial administration processes for quickly accessing funds in emergency situations and procuring what's needed quickly and with accountability and transparency. And that all must work together if you're going to make these instruments effective. So this is a, a further graphic dis display of the, what the blue images were in the last slide. This is a risk layering strategy that I'm sure most of you have seen. And the first line is, you know, countries will often use budgetary reallocation for the high frequency, low intensity events, maybe a national disaster fund uh, that will come in that countries can quickly access for immediate liquidity. The next line under risk retention instruments where countries are retaining all of their risk, um, accessing contingent lines of credit like um, uh, instruments from the World Bank or, or IDB. Um, and then the green um, instruments are more the insurance-related instruments that are cost-effective for the higher intensity, lower frequency events. And so we've got parametric um, budget support, uh, indemnity coverage for assets, uh, catastrophe insurance for private property and agriculture, which uh, governments can also support private sector development of. These are examples of the, the big cat risk pools right now, or sovereign cat risk insurance pools right now. Uh, CRIF is the oldest and the biggest in the Caribbean African risk capacity built off of, well, developed lessons with lessons learned from CRIF for in, uh, drought insurance in, in Africa, and then CDRIF and PCRIFI in Southeast Asia and, and Pacific. This is a growing field. So how do we convince governments to use parametric insurance, and, and why is it important? Um, to be a part of their disastrous financing strategy. One, obviously it transfers risk to the private sector. You're not retaining all your risk, especially for those super expensive, um, high impact events. It's expenditure smoothing. If you're paying, if you can reliably pay a million dollars in premium each year, uh, it's a lot easier to, to plan ahead and budget for if you're not faced with frequent interruptions of needing to spend 10 million in response to a disaster. Immediate liquidity post-disaster. One of the benefits of parametric insurance as opposed to indemnity, you get it immediately. And many studies show the multiplying effects of losses that go unaddressed if you can't access funds to address those losses or start the recovery process. Parametric triggers can complement other triggers for contingent financing. So parametric, you get it. If the wind speed reaches a certain level, if a rainfall happens, you, you don't have control over whether you get it. You get it or you don't. With other types of contingent credit, like a loan from the World Bank set up in advance, that might have a soft trigger, like declaration of emergency. So balancing soft and hard triggers to access financing. Coverage is customizable, and it comes with technical assistance. Most importantly, it's cost effective, more so than indemnity insurance. Recipe for successful risk pool, and this is the last slide. Obviously, you need strong political will at the national level. You need a champion. 
Um, so it was very easy for countries to join CRIF. Um, they very quickly got membership in the first year uh, of almost 75% of countries in the Caribbean because it was built after Hurricane Ivan in 2004 that hit Grenada, which was another hurricane that completely devastated Grenada. Um, over 200% of GDP and the whole region came together and said, we need to do something. This can't keep happening to our brothers and sisters. So CRIF was established with support from the World Bank. Countries quickly joined um, because they understood, decision makers understood that this could happen to their island next. Um, galvanizing regional institution or event. As I mentioned, Hurricane Ivan in, in Grenada, but there's also um, great Caribbean economic uh, cooperation that led to, to an existing kind of environment of cooperation. Donors support on premiums. This is hugely important in the Caribbean. It's a rising um, thing that donors like to do is giving money directly to CRIF to either indirectly reduce premiums or give discounts. Um, it's a way for donors to kind of multiply the, the power of their giving. Um, having built-in mechanisms to reduce risk. There's a lot of products out there uh, that are also saying, look, if you can, there's a, a fisheries product that CRIF has put out that says, look, if you can abide by regional fisheries legislation, if you can make sure that your boats are maintained and in working order, um, and if you can really help to formalize the sector and reduce risk uh, to the fisheries sector, here's this insurance product. Um, so, and that can happen in the housing sector by premium discounts for hurricane straps, et cetera. So incentivizing risk reduction is hugely important in insurance. Um, make it part of your comprehensive strategy that's approved at the executive or parliament level. Um, have collaborative stakeholders that are constantly pushing for, for new and, and better instruments to respond to client needs. Um, and of course, education components that come with helping governments understand exactly what parametric insurance is so that their expectations for a payout align with what's actually going to happen. And so there's less of the, the mismatch between expectation and, and payout from events. Um, I'm gonna stop there and I think, it, I think Jerry's coming on next, who's, who's yes. the grandfather of parametric insurance in, in the Caribbean and globally. Thank you. Well, I, I think I want to start by saying uh, grandfathers don't get there unless they have a lot of people working with them. And uh, I had the real privilege of being at the University of Kentucky and let, let, let me do anything I wanted, okay? Academic freedom is so important. And Ben Collier sitting here, he's going to speak later. He's one of the PhD students that had a lot to do with my learning uh, and People in the World Bank had a lot to do with my learning, uh, and it's good to see this community so actively engaging in that way. So I've got three things. How do you get these solutions to the poor? I totally agree with our friend from the DC yesterday. Uh, I don't want to ask poor to pay for uh, another insurance policy. That's tough. <clears throat> So that's one. How do you make it more affordable? And I want to emphasize pooling, risk pooling, and building institutional infrastructure in a way that can drive those solutions so that people in this room who are working right now on pilots in different geographies could actually come together and do some risk pooling in a way that crowds the industry in because the industry is interested, and they're going to watch all of these different things, but uh, it's, it's high transaction cost. It's not scalable. And as much as the industry is there watching and helping you think about it, um, if it doesn't scale, that's the end of it, right? How do we make an institutional framework so things you're talking about scale? And the third thing I want to talk to is uh, resilient infrastructure. And how do you tie these, these ideas into resilient infrastructure? That's sev several things. And I'm happy to, in the hallway, <laughs> elaborate on these, OK? I didn't bring a PowerPoint. Now, the, the, the first item of reaching the poor, 
this was what drove me into international work. And I was trying to look at household level products for small scale farmers in the world. And soon I was having PhD students build puzzles to actually see how withdrawing premium uh, from the cash, the equity position of the household, how it would affect their growth. And I wasn't sure when we were finished with those puzzles, Monte Carlo kind of puzzles, whether or not you made the poor better off or worse off if you had them paying for insurance. Think about it. So how do you reach the poor? All the work we were doing with Gates Foundation, which Ben was involved in in Peru, was targeted at actually working with the groups that access the poor and the risk aggregators that are working directly with the poor, financial institutions, microfinance institutions, uh, value chain firms, humanitarian organizations, NGOs. So it seems to me that there's that kind of energy in this room when you're talking about community-based aggregation and using the community structure of some sort to actually have these disastrous financing solutions in place and Mary did a real nice job. I won't go through that layering, but it's in my DNA now because we started doing those puzzles long ago with people at the World Bank. So uh, reaching the poor, it seems that we need to focus at the MISO level, the firms, the entities that actually service the poor. And when you, when you unpack that puzzle, appreciate that those groups are going to be constrained to go into the high-risk areas because of these types of highly correlated events. Constrained means lack of access to financial services, lack of access to other services for the poor that live in that community, and it also means that the cost of capital is going to be high, right? So there's real economic thinking of how you protect the position of the firms that actually serve the poor. The second thing is risk pooling. The Caribbean, the CRIF, was fundamentally about how you take these isolated island states that can have that type of everybody gets hit at the same time and pool it across that geography so that you could get better pricing in the market. We did this with Vision Fund International and Global Parametrics. Uh, we have, with Vision Fund, 27 microfinance institutions we have 51 subcontracts, if you will, in a single contract. That's a derivative contract, by the way, coming out of the fund that we manage. In that single contract, what we modeled was the probable maximum loss, meaning that the cost of the insurance versus buying every one of those 51 is one third the cost. It's Markowitz, it's, it's portfolio diversification. And don't forget, if you pick up an insurance text, a classic text will say, a precondition of insurance is independent risk. That's not what we're talking about here. Now, we have lots of examples of this. Long ago, I, I modeled the US reinsurance agreement for the US Crop Insurance Corporation. So I'm a little bit of a geek in modeling, but fundamentally, I am an institutional economist and a public policy advisor, okay? So I've watched it from all sides. Let's be, let's be real. The industry is going to be rent-seeking. Uh, and that doesn't, that's not a bad thing, because you've got willing partners. But there's ways to think about how you set up that institutional infrastructure. And that's what we did with Global Parametrics. We built on the ideas of CRIF by bringing a global fund together focused on low and middle income countries. And with Vision Fund, you know, one that I'm really proud of, and now we're replicating that with several other groups, where you give the benefit of the pooling when they bring different geographies, different types of risk to you, okay? Now, from my perspective, and I think I'm getting somewhere with the industry, this is how you're gonna grow the market in emerging economies. This is how you're gonna grow the market here for the poor and vulnerable in the United States as well. So I've talked about two things I wanna to touch just a moment. I've got a couple more minutes. 
on adaptive infrastructure. Look, I get really tired of people talking about climate insurance. There's no product out there that's climate insurance. Climate's a long-term phenomena. Everything you hear about is an event of extreme weather that happens on a short cycle, right? That's not climate. However, if we want to think through how we get into a position to really put some longevity, I think the way to consider this is as you're building these resilient infrastructures, whatever community it is, ask the engineers from day one, how are you going to make this resilient and by the way, engineers already think insurance terms because they talk about P90s, or if they're doing wind turbines, they talk about irrigation systems. I'm going to engineer it so 98% of the time you've got water, 2% of the time I can't build enough concrete to do that, right? So put in place the trade-off between risk transfer and infrastructure improvements. From day one, projects should be building that type of adaptation process. And as the climate changes, as the risk transfer becomes more expensive, you have more incentives to go in and re reinforce the infrastructure. And when we're talking about infrastructure, there's so many fundamental infrastructures, water treatment facilities that are vulnerable, uh, power lines that blow down, we need to get them underground, right? Especially in the Caribbean. So there's, there's a lot of ways to bring that together. Uh, I, I'm, I'm very pleased to be here, and thank you again for, uh, for inviting me. By the way, you know, we, we did work with Carolyn and uh, Helen and Song on this paper on how do you do this with the CDFIs, the Community Development Financial Institutions. And for my money, there's a, there's a risk aggregator that works with the poor all over this country, and the institutional infrastructure that we created for global parametrics could fit perfectly well there, where we have a fund that we manage to do risk transfer. We pool it. If you work with those CDFIs and allow them to reinforce the lending practices on the backside of a disaster, which is what Vision Fund's whole idea was, is to go in and do recovery lending. Believe me, when you have Sandy, Katrina, lending dries up, and who gets hurt the most? The poor and vulnerable. So there's a, there's, for my money still, Carolyn, you know, there's a really natural place to bring together a lot of this experience and these ideas with the CDFs, CDFIs, uh, that might require some type of legislation at some point. So thank you very much for the time, and it's, it's great to be here. Okay, thank you. Stacy Ann, are you still there? Yes, I am. Okay, great, great. Um, so I'd like to uh, open up the floor for a few questions. We have about six or seven more minutes. Uh, are there any questions, comments? Yes, sir. Uh, we started with the global circulation models. We use ECWMF. If you're watching US television weather stations now, you talk about the US model, and the European model. Europeans are doing it better right now. Uh, so we use their data. It's a global data, daily, uh, hourly information on lots of different estimates of variables. Uh, they, they do this historically. Uh, they do the reanalysis. They do the real-time data, and they do forecasts. Uh, I didn't mention that when it, in Peru we, we built the first forecast insurance product in the world. Think about that, getting cash in well before the disaster. Those are things that are possible. But those same data systems fit perfectly well in the United States. Uh, 
We, by the way, we do have a heat product. Some, somebody was saying there's no heat, heat wave product, but we, we do have one of those products as well. And it was being used in India. Does that answer your question, Craig? Other questions? Yes, please, ma'am. Um, that's a great question, and often, you know, I'm a U.S. citizen, I'm one of very few U.S. citizens who work at the World Bank, and we, I, I was just telling Jerry, I've got blinders on as to what's happening in the United States sometimes because I'm so focused on everything happening, but then I hear Ms. McFadden speak this morning, and to know that there's no emergency procurement regulations for access, like, these things are blowing my mind, and the fact that there's no contingent reserve fund in place for accessing liquidity quick, that's shocking to me. Um, so, I'd say, look, I mean, I don't want to speak above my pay grade, but there's a, <laughs> executive directors of the World Bank who are pushing World Bank policy, but not looking internally, um, and saying, how can I take lessons from the World Bank back to U.S. government to do knowledge exchange, knowledge sharing? Um, we would be happy to have these kinds of, um, w at the World Bank, we're going to want money for it sometimes. <laughs> If it's not, uh, we have a lot of donors who want the global public good, but we also have like reimbursable advisory services that governments um, in Europe or higher income countries can can purchase technical assistance from the World Bank to address some of these problems. If you need actual solutions more than just talking at events and things like that, so there, there's options, and I, I think that a lot of um, higher income countries and and members and donors to the World Bank are not also looking inwardly at their own. You know, climate resilience and saying how can we benefit from global lessons learned. So I think it's up to these higher level decision makers to look inwardly and, and push for that. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, I have a question for Stacey Ann, which is that, you know, in the U.S., we have a lot of important efforts going on at the subnational level. Um, but you mentioned the importance in the Caribbean of, you know, national and regional leadership. And I guess I would use the leadership question or attribute as sort of a key into the broader question of, you know, are there lessons that we can learn from the Caribbean in the U.S. relating to how to establish this leadership and in other areas, um, you know, regarding the provision especially of insurance? Well, I think for me, one of the caveats is I don't necessarily focus on the subnational level when I look at um, the Caribbean or other small island regions. So I'm not able to speak um, about what happens at the subnational level. But I think um, for the leadership, and I think you mentioned this in your opening comments as well, Todd, is that Prime Minister Motley has just been a trailblazing force, right? And one of the things that I personally admire about her and her approach um, is that she's doing something that we probably thought never was possible, right? So I wouldn't necessarily want to separate the vision from the leadership. So I think that's one of the lessons that perhaps um, US government officials could, could um, uh, take with them is that you have to have the, the vision and that for that to be supported um, by, by action. So that would be um, my suggestion. Okay, thank you. Maybe one more question or comment? Do we have one more? Yes, please. 
yeah, would any of our panelists care to take that? I guess the idea of uh, how you actually organize uh, premium support is, is really fundamental. And Veronica's in the back of the room. She's working on this. Uh, so you might want to speak with her a bit. Uh, we made a lot of mistakes in the past in the U.S. with U.S. crop insurance, where I grew up and watched it uh, go from a program that had a, uh, some premium to 70% premium. A uh, lot of inefficiencies there and maybe unintended consequences in terms of who actually gets benefits, but it's certainly an, an important discussion. I did want to add one more thing. Um, Global Parametrics was acquired by Celsius Pro, and Celsius Pro provides a lot of the services that were asked about, Kathy, uh, and they do, they do that in the United States as well. They have consulting services, they have the data systems, they have advisory services, and now that they have uh, sight on what we've done, I was in New York with the CEO on Wednesday, and we're talking to capital market providers. So we will be working in the United States as well. Okay, I want to thank our virtual panelists for joining us, and uh, for our two face-to-face -face panelists, thank you very much as well. And it's been a good panel. Thank you. All right, so I guess we have a...